Well, this morning I'm beginning a new message series entitled, Finding Christ in the Confusion. This series will take us through Paul's New Testament letter to the Colossians. And Paul writes this letter somewhere between A.D. 60 and A.D. 63. Paul writes the letter to people in a church that he has never met. And Paul writes this letter while he is under house arrest in the city of Rome. Most scholars agree that one of Paul's colleagues, a man named Epaphras, actually started the church in Colossae after he heard Paul preach and teach in the city of Ephesus. Epaphras takes the long journey from Colossae to Rome to inform Paul about the church and to get some advice. The church at Colossae is flourishing, but some false teachers have made their way into the church and are now confusing everybody about what they should believe and not believe. This false teaching is a combination of beliefs from the Greek world and the Jewish world. This intermixing of philosophies, ideas, and religions is called syncretism. And this strange mixture of beliefs confuses everybody and sends everybody looking for answers. The most dangerous part of this false teaching is that it undervalues Christ and diminishes what He did for us. As a result, Paul tries to clear up the confusion by placing a lot of emphasis upon the supremacy of Christ. Paul presents an exalted Christ, both in who he is and in what he accomplished. These first century Christians were confused about Christ, and they were confused about what they believe. When we fast forward to the 21st century, the confusion hasn't gone away. In fact, things may be more confusing today than in any time during church history. Christians today are challenged on every side by a variety of beliefs and philosophies that claim to be the truth. The practice of syncretism or blending ideas from different sources continues today. People borrow something from this philosophy, then they borrow something else from that philosophy, and they end up creating their own religion. They take some of their ideas from the Bible, other ideas from movies and television shows, and still other ideas from the media, and they create what they think works best for them. The result is that Christians end up believing a mixture of conflicting doctrines, ideas, and practices. Most people in our country claim to be Christian. And over a million people in our country go to church every Sunday, either in person or online. But how many of those people are confident in what they believe? How many Christians can articulate their faith to their family members and friends? How many know for sure what they believe about Christ? And how many are just confused? Many years ago, the famous evangelist George Whitfield was talking with a man about the Christian faith. And Whitfield says to the man, What do you believe? The man answers, I believe what my church believes. And what does your church believe? asks Whitfield. Well, it believes what I believe, the man answered. The evangelist tried one more time. And what do you both believe? The man answered, we believe the same thing. Well, what do Christians believe? According to a survey that was published last year, 98% of evangelicals believe that the Bible's accounts of Jesus' resurrection are 
accurate. And 91% believe that everything the Bible teaches is accurate. Yet over 65% of this same group agreed with this statement. Jesus is the first and greatest thing that God created. And over 30% believe that Jesus is not God, but simply a great teacher. Even before COVID, one-third of professing Christians say they never go to church, but still believe that they are Christian. The goal in this series is to find Christ in all the confusion. We want to discover Jesus and allow Him to dictate our beliefs instead of us dictating our beliefs to Him. We want to find out what we should believe about our Christian faith and why we should believe those things. We want to navigate our way through all the confusion and be able to answer the question, who is Jesus and what has Jesus done that's so important? Well, we begin today by talking about the Christian good news. Paul starts out his letter to the Colossians by talking about the gospel or the good news. Christians, both in the first century and in the 21st century, need to understand their faith. And that begins with understanding the Christian good news. So if you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to open it to the New Testament letter to the Colossians. Paul talks about and explains the Christian good news in Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Beginning with verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and, understand, and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear, dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Following standard letter-writing procedures from the ancient world, Paul begins in verses 1 and 2 by introducing himself and by greeting his readers. Then Paul continues to follow ancient custom with an expression of thanksgiving for his readers. Paul gives thanks for the Colossian church in one long Greek sentence that covers verses 3 through 8. Paul's theme in this Thanksgiving section is the gospel. Paul talks in verses 5 and 6 about how the gospel has come to the Colossians. Paul doesn't want the Colossians to be confused. He wants the Colossians to understand the gospel in all its truth. The gospel simply means good news. The same good news that has come to the Colossians is also going all over the world. God has one message of good news for all people. And God's message of good news cannot be changed. The good news that Paul writes about to the Colossians is the same good news that we need to understand today. When Paul talks about the gospel or the good news he talks about faith, hope, 
in love. These three words make up the good news. The good news, the gospel, consists of faith, hope, and love. Paul uses these same three words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul concludes the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, 13 by saying, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love proclaim God's message of good news. So let's take a closer look at those three words and what they teach us about the Christian good news. Number one, the Christian good news is received by faith. Paul writes in verse 4 that he gives thanks for the Colossians because he has heard of their faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is mentioned first because it's the starting point. Ephesians 11.6 reminds us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Matthew Henry writes, Faith opens the door of the soul to receive Christ. Faith is the door. Faith is the hinge on which the door swings. Faith is the key that unlocks the door. Faith is the impulse to open the door when the knock comes. Faith is the willingness to let Jesus in. Faith is surrender which allows Jesus to become the master of the house. Faith is the act of placing our trust and confidence in someone or something. And when it comes to the Christian good news, there's only one true object of faith, Jesus Christ. The Colossians put their faith in Christ. They trust Christ. They commit their lives to Christ. And they have a living spiritual connection with Christ. Many people today are confused and believe that their ticket to heaven is a matter of making sure that their good deeds outnumber their bad deeds. George Barna conducted a survey many years ago in which he asked this question, do you agree or disagree with this statement? As long as a person is generally good or does enough good things for others during their life, then they will earn a place in heaven. 70% of those surveyed agreed with that statement. Religion tells you to work hard, to do good things, to follow the Ten Commandments. Religion says, do this and don't do that, and you might make it to heaven. But here's the problem with religion. How much do you have to do? And how can you know when you've done enough? Religion can't answer those questions because a right relationship with God has nothing to do with being good enough or religious enough. The way to heaven the way to a right relationship with God is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's to ask Jesus to be your personal Savior. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's not about what you do for God. It's about what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Paul gives thanks that the Colossians have put their faith in Jesus Christ. How about you? What is the object of your faith? Are you trusting you 
to make things right with God? Or are you trusting Jesus to make things right with God for you? Number two, the Christian good news rests in hope. Paul talks in verse 5 about the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. You see, the word hope in the Bible isn't simply wishing for something. It's a confident expectation and assurance. Hope makes all the difference because it's our expectation that God that everything God says in the Bible is either true today or will come true in the future. You see, our hope is stored up in heaven. We have a treasure waiting for us in heaven. 1 Peter 1.4 talks about the fact that we have an inheritance that is being kept in heaven for us. Christians have the promise Not only that Jesus has forgiven our sins and made us right with God again, but that one day He will welcome us into His presence for all eternity. We have hope right now because God will keep His promise in the future. When we read the newspapers and magazines and watch the nightly news, we often walk away with a sense of hopelessness. Is there anything I can hang my hat on? Is there something or someone I can trust? The world seems to be falling apart and getting worse. Is there any hope out there? Christians have hope in Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in a principle. It's not in a philosophy or even a religion. Our hope is in a person, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.3 states that God has given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope because our hope is in a living person. Jesus defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave. He's alive. And because He lives, my hope lives. I have a living hope. I'm not alone in this world. Jesus Christ lives within me. And no matter what I'm facing right now, in my moment of weakness or peril or hopelessness, Jesus is with me. Life is hard, but I have hope because Jesus can handle my troubles right now and one day He's going to welcome me into a place where there are no troubles. Do you have hope this morning? Is your hope in your situation or is your hope in your Savior? Number three. The Christian good news results in love. Paul talks in verse 4 about the love that the Colossians have for all believers in Jesus Christ. And the word that Paul uses for love isn't an abstract concept. It's not an emotional attraction. It's not even a gushy feeling. The word for love means that it's unconditional sacrificial, and life-transforming. It's the same word that, of, for love that God has for all people, which resulted in Him sending Jesus to die for our sins. Christians are to show love for one another, just as Christ has shown love for us. Jesus is saying to us, in a world where people have little value for each other, I want you to love each other. In a world where people just don't care, I want you to love one another. The reputation of Christians ought to be, wow, 
how they love one another. When people look at the church, they ought to be able to conclude, look at how those people love each other. That sounds good. But we have a hard time loving people. Why? We think loving people means that we need to agree about everything. But Christians have never agreed about everything, and they never will agree about everything. For example, Christians today disagree when it comes to music preference, Bible translation preference, political preferences, to get the vaccine or not to get the vaccine. And when will Jesus most likely return? We must learn that we can love one another even if we disagree about certain things. The Apostle Paul did not try to solve all the differences among Christians in his day. Instead, he writes a general principle in Romans chapter 14, verse 5. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Paul is saying, you pray about the matter and you do what you think God wants you to do. And I'll pray about the matter and I'll do what I think God wants me to do. If we disagree with each other, we can still love each other. Our love is not dependent upon our agreements. Our love depends upon Jesus' love. For us. The Christian message is good news. It's good news for every person. It's good news that's based upon faith, hope, and love. You become a Christian by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You trust Jesus to forgive your sins and give you a right relationship with God. You have hope in a hopeless world because Jesus can handle your troubles today and He has promised and given you the expectation that one day you're going to spend forever with Him in a perfect place. You have the freedom to love your fellow Christians because God loves you. God isn't asking you to agree with each other about everything. God is asking you to treat the other person in the same way that He has treated you. The Christian good news comes down to faith, hope, and love. Is your faith in Jesus Christ? Is your hope based upon what Jesus has promised you? Are you loving people in the same way that Jesus loves you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that in a world of bad news, you've given us good news. The good news of faith, hope, and love. And what good news it is. Our salvation doesn't depend upon good deeds and bad deeds. It depends upon faith in Christ. Our hope doesn't depend upon whether things are going well or whether things are falling apart. Our hope depends upon your promises and your willingness to keep your word. And our love doesn't depend upon our agreements. It depends upon how Jesus treated us. Good news, faith, hope, and love. Father, it's my prayer that we will wrap ourselves around those three words. And may those three words bring good news to all of us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we wrap things up this morning, it's about faith. Is your faith in Jesus or is your faith in you? Let me encourage you. To put your faith in Jesus. 
All of us are looking for hope. Where do we look to find hope? Is it in the promises of the government? The promises of our friends? The promises of how things are going in life? Or do we anchor our hope in the promises of God? Christians are to love each other. Do we love each other as long as we agree with each other? Or do we love each other because Jesus has loved us? Faith, hope, and love. Which of those three words do you need to look at more closely? Do you need to look at faith and where your faith is really anchored? Do you need to look at hope and who you're trusting in to give you hope? Do you need to look at love and how you're treating other people? Faith, hope, and love. It's good news. But we have to act accordingly to that good news. So let me encourage you. Put your faith in Jesus. Put your hope in God's promises. And love one another even if they disagree with you. It'll change your life.